was I on? I felt like the night was surrendering to me, filling me up with its pictures. I was getting glimpses of everything. I was vert high, running through a dark space, with some crowd behind me, with nothing in me mouth, no feather in me mouth. Cop sirens were sounding off, making bad music, whistles blowing, the howling of a generator as it pumped hard power to a set of arc lights, shadow cops shining down, feet clattering, real human feet clattering over concrete. Didn't know where I was, coming up hard against the brick wall and turning away, and there was the Murdoch, scarred up face glaring at me, dancers, former dancers, panicking behind me in a crush, in a little crush, and then scattering, and then me left there, alone, facing the Murdoch's scars. I've got you! The gun in her hand was crackling with a shiny new life, like it had living bullets in its chambers. Murdoch's gun was the only thing in my life, the only thing worth living for. It gets like that sometimes with instruments of death. What's it gonna be, kid? Dirty or clean? Murdoch's gun was a raging hard-on, pointing straight at me, straight to the heart. There was just a glint of sun coming up over a rooftop and a dark mist forming to her right. Other cops were moving into position. I could hear screams and cheers as people were brought down or people were escaping. I could feel the Beatles' presence way up close, but I couldn't see him anywhere. The mist behind Murdoch's right shoulder solidified into a twisting shape. I knew that face. That shape. Shaka! The blown apart shadow cop. His smoking body was a mess of fumes, and his face was a grimace of smoke. He was waving in and out of existence as his newfangled box of tricks struggled to shine his broken body into the real world so that it could lick there, feeding on secrets. Murdoch waved the gun. Turn around slowly. Towards the wall. No surprises. I don't like surprises. Sure. So I'm turning to the wall. Just in the very act of turning. When I sense Beetle nearby. That's how it was. I could just sense him. The Beetle steps out of the shadows. Holding his gun aloft. Like an offering. Murdoch had seen that gun before. And now here she was. Once again on the dirty end. You could tell she wasn't too keen on it. Same with the shaka. He'd taken punishment from it. Now here he was once again on the dirty end. Made me feel good just to be free for once of the dirty end. Murdoch was sweating. Fluid was running down the claw marks in her face. At the junction of Wilbraham Road and some poor bugger's driveway rested the mobile kennel of Dingo Tush and his pack of canine players. Hey, hey, we're the werewolves, painted on the side. Next to it, I could see Tristan and Suze, their hair a strong river flowing with moonlight. Suze had the two robo-hounds on a double leash. The dogs were almost as tall as she was and baying for cop blood. I was dancing, that twitching dance that only the truly scared to fuck can manage, but my mind was like a stranger, a cold-hearted stranger with a gun in his hands. That was the beetle. Mandy came up behind him, her eyes darting from point to point as she made out how the twin guns were poised, one on my heart, the other on a she-cop's head. Moon was still, full and voiceless. I'm taking this one moment at a time, step by step, because it's difficult and because it's so important. Murdoch spoke up. You're going down for the murder of a police officer, Beetle. So take me. Murdoch let the sweat droplets roll down her face, down her arms, down her fingers, to the trigger on the gun. It was slippery. The whole thing was slippery. The shadow cop fired a thin, shaking info beam straight to the gun in Beetle's hand. Four bullets left. B smiled. You taking a chance, Murdoch? Well, I guess so. Someone was going to get killed, hurt, or arrested. Maybe it was me. Most probably it was me. Some things just seem bound. This is how we lost Desdemona and found the thing. Yeah, time to tell it. Sister and brother flying down through a feather's embrace into the voodoo world to land softly in a garden of bliss walled in by ancient stones surrounded by colours and perfume a jungle of flowers 
Bright yellow birds were singing bright yellow songs from the trees that were growing visibly, even while we fell to the floor of petals. Her cunt was pressed against my cock, and the world was beautiful. I've done this already, I thought. Maybe this is the haunting. Maybe I'm inside the vert just now. But I dismissed that thought real easy, so I, I couldn't have been, could I? Could I? Then I slipped inside of her, the sister, feeling the walled garden close in to caress me penis until the sap rose to the top and the garden was flooded. The air was heavy with pollen and the whole world was copying itself over and over through the act of sex. And we were enfolded in the system, sucking where the bee sucks. We were being watched. I rolled off Desdemona's slick body onto the ground. A hooded figure was standing some five feet away, watching, just watching. I lifted myself up, just to get a better look, only to find myself sinking into the figure's yellow sun gaze. I'd been eaten. Welcome to English Voodoo. You have come for knowledge. There will be pleasure, because knowledge is sexy. There will also be pain, because knowledge is torture. Do you understand what I'm saying? Des answered, yeah, we understand. Did we? Good. Join us. Other figures were appearing, moving in from a distance, like images on a photographic plate. They were all hooded and covered the same head to foot, so that you could not distinguish between them. One of the figures called out in a small bird-like whistle. A yellow bird, a canary, flew down into his hands. He stroked it carefully until the bird was happy and then he gently plucked a feather out of its plumage. It was a yellow feather, and he held it up for all to see. It looked like a dream. The figure opened his hand to let the bird fly free. Then he raised the yellow feather to his lips. He sucked it in, and then was gone, sinking into the earth, into a hole that opened up and then closed again as the figure disappeared beneath the soil. The golden feather was left there, floating in the air, free of all restraints. The next figure plucked it from the air, stroked it in, then was gone, sinking, and so on, until only the initial figure remained. Sister asked it, where are they going? To the past, the bad past, in search of knowledge, the figure answered. Why don't you try it? Desdemona hesitated for a second, and then took the yellow feather into her hands. Desdemona placed the feather between her lips. Bears, it might be dangerous. It's a yellow feather, Scrib. Haven't you always wanted to take one of those? Yeah, but how many chances do you get? This is ours. Let's do it. Please don't go, Des. Did no good. Desdemona pushed the golden feather in deep to the limits. Her eyes flashed yellow just the once, and then the ground was opening up beneath her feet, and the weeds were pulling at her, yellow weeds spiked with thorns. They dragged her down into the soil until only her hair was left, her beautiful hair, and then even that was gone, strangled by the weeds, until only the weeds were left, the blonde flowers. They grew over where she buried herself, smothering the space in a second. The figure had the feather in her hands, and she was offering it to me. Go fuck yourself, my words. Very well. You are too weak. Maybe one day. And with that, she pushed the feather into her own mouth. Her eyes flashed more golden than the sun on a hot day. And I was alone, in the garden, in the English garden. The feather floated for a moment, then started to fall. I reached out for it. I reached out for it. A yellow bird flew down, a blur of speed, caught the feather in her beak, and then was gone. The garden was empty. I stayed there for two, three hours, I don't know, a long time. And then I jerked out. This was how we lost Desdemona. And how I came to wake up, smothered by a thing from Vert, some heavy shit. Exchange rates, some heavy losses.
Murdoch slowly swung a gun away from me towards the real threat. Twin guns now. Both of them pointed towards each other, mirrored in the same need. Beetle and Murdoch. I heard the moon howl. Dingo Tush was in the area. His jaws were split wide so that the inside was visible, slavering. He was calling up dogs from all over the fallow field, howling at the moon. Felt like the moon was howling. I could hear the dogs responding. I guess Murdoch got some visions of the Carly dog just then, and she didn't fancy a repeat play of the last pad debacle. The gun reared up in her hands as it spat smoke, then the noise of it, then the bullet reaching out for a new home. The beetle answered her more or less the same time, not quite the same time. Listen carefully. This is the secret of how to live. Fire your gun before somebody else does. The beetle reeled back from the bullet. His shoulder exploded. It was a warm flower opening up on his flesh. I got flecked with some beetle blood across my cheeks. There was a siren ringing in my head. Behind me closed up eyes and the howling of wolves as the dog pack ran riot. There were bullets suddenly flying everywhere. I had a high pitch inside of me, a high-pitched screaming, like some woman had caught a stray shot. Wonder who that was? Caught a bad gift? Hope it wasn't Mandy. Hope it wasn't. And I felt myself being lifted up. Lifted up above everything. Above the world of rain. Above the world with its screamings and its sirens and all of its pain dripping away like the last few raindrops into a small, quiet pool of sunlight. Where was I going? And who was taking me? I'm walking through the leafy lane of a small town. Children are playing on the green. The postman whistles a jaunty melody. Mothers hang washing on lines. Birds sing from leafy, sun-drenched trees. I walk towards the post office. Its sign calls it Pleasureville Post Office. I know where I am now. I'm in Pleasureville. A low-level blue vert. Nothing special, totally legal. Been there before, years before, when such things excited me, but never like this. Never like this. Not without a feather. I was just there. Totally there. With no pain. No anxiety. No hassles. And the knowledge that I was there, that I knew I was there, in the vert, and that another world was waiting for me. If I so wished a world of pain, I could pull out any time or stay here forever. That's forever, which is a vicious temptation. The first time that I came down, I came down into a dog world. Smelt bad, real bad, after the sweet, feathery aromas of Pleasureville. There was a dog face looming over me. Mixed in there, amongst the fur and the jaws, were some bare traces of the human lineaments. This only made it worse, the shock of seeing that face, one of the many heads of Cerberus, leaning right over me, and that breath, that stench on me face. They tell me I screamed then. Maybe I did. I was too busy getting out of there, out of me head. The pleasure postman greeted me with a cheery hello. Anything for me today, Posty? Just the one, Mr Scribble. I opened the sun golden envelope and pulled out a birthday card. The card was the brightest yellow I'd ever seen. The words, Happy Birthday, were written in a dark and clotted red hand across the yellow. I opened the card to find out whose birthday it was. The second time I came down, I was in a travelling kennel of mad dogs. The stench was still there, ten times worse, but at least the dog face had left me alone. I was pressed up against the rear doors, like I'd been the last to get into the van. There were no windows, but I could feel that we were moving at some speed, some law-breaking speed, along a bumpy path. Felt like a well-jammed-up beetle was at the wheel, the old style, and I was glad for that. I raised myself up on a pair of skinless elbows. All I got was the fleshy hindquarters of dogs. There are times in life when this is all you get. They were tight-pressed in that small space, maybe seven or eight of them. Difficult to tell, what with the van lights broken and the mishmash of their bodies. All of them had bits of dog mixed in there and bits of human, only in varying degrees, and they were crowded and pressed over some other forms. What the fuck was under there? Then I saw Beetle's face through a gap in the van. 
but surely the beetle was driving. Then his face was covered by the closing fur once more. That's when Tristan screamed from the dogs, from the middle of all those canines, those half-humans. I remembered the stray bullet and that maybe someone had been caught by it and maybe that someone was Tristan. It was, but not in that way. Had to get out of there. I opened up the birthday card in Pleasureville. The sun was overhead. Birds were singing, kids playing. The postman was already whistling along the road to the next letterbox. It felt like a holiday, like a birthday. But whose birthday? I opened the card and read the message scrawled there in blood-thick ink. I could hear her voice calling through the ink. Happy birthday, Scrib. Bet you never realised, eh? You were always forgetting. Me, I'll never forget. Sorry I couldn't get me present to you, but will this do? Until we get back together, don't stop looking, Scrib. I'm still waiting. We'll be together one day, promise? Your loving sister, Des. There were tears in my eyes. Must have been the first tears ever in Pleasureville. Nobody cries there. I wanted to keep the card, so I reached into my pocket for something to exchange, to leave behind. I pulled out Beetle's backy box. I clicked it open and pulled out the tapeworm of feather. This I shoved back into my pocket, then I closed the box and laid it down on a nearby street bench. The third time I came down, I came down to the breakfast table. I was back in my new flat, shoveling a bowl of JFK flakes down my throat. I came down with the spoon halfway in my mouth, and the crispness of the flakes against the coldness of the milk made me feel like a king, like life was actually worth something, worth getting up for. That good, those flakes. Twinkle's eyes were looking at me from the other side of the table. Happy birthday, Scrib. How did you know that? Beetle told me. Beetle? Where the fuck's he? He's in your room. Mandy was with him. She was sitting beside the bed on an old wicker chair. The beetle was lying in my bed with his eyes closed, a feather stuck halfway down his throat. What's he on, Mandy? Tapeworm or what else? I pulled back gently on the sheets, revealing the wound. His shoulder was a sprawling mess, but the strips of flesh were held together and bandaged with some kind of web. Looked like a nest of dog fur. The blood was congealing behind there. Some kind of healing, maybe. My eyes were wet. I could barely look. Beetle. Beetle. He must have picked up on my voice down in the darkness because he was mumbling words around the feather. I pulled that feather out jerking him away from the dream, just like he used to do with me when I went in alone. He came back to us with a slow rising, as though he was used by now to being dragged back, maybe by Mandy, as though he was riding the feathers real easy these days. What is it, my man? Is there no end to the trouble, B? No end, Scribble. Not since the schoolyard, remember that? His eyes were slitted, crusted, just a glimpse of eyeball showing through between the twin layers of bloated skin. I remember, B. You used to bully me something rotten. Aye. Good days. Don't give up the fight, Scribble. How could I? Keep on finding them. The Brid and the sister and the thing. Don't give up on me. Talk to the Ding about this. What's that, B? The Dingo? Does, does he... He might know something. I caught something in the van. They thought I was out of it. He smiled. It was a painful smile. You know me, Scrib. Down but never out. I don't think I'm up to it, B. I hated every word, but knew each one to be true. Tristan needs your help, Scrib. Tristan does? Somebody caught a stray bullet. Help the man. And then his eyes closed, his lips closed. The beetle was sleeping, and it was my time to leave. Dingo Tush was waiting for me in the corridor. He'd just come out of Twinkle's room, and he had Carly, the robo-dog, in his arms. The bitch was flopping upside down in his half-human paws. A constant, low-pitched whine was falling out from her jaws. 
Carly's pretty upset. She's just a dog. Oh, shit. Silly thing to say. I will forgive that slight indiscretion. Beetle told me you might know about Brid and the Thing, where they are. Why should I know that? I'm just following the Beetle. What do you know? I know a good record when I hear one. What do you think I know? I'm a pop star, for fuck's sake. And if you don't mind, I have an all-nighter to get to. Oh, you'd best not be lying, Dingo. Ooh, big, tough. He gives me his famous smile, the one with all the teeth on show. Holy shit. I would have you for breakfast, dear boy. I opened the door to Twinkle's bedroom. Tristan was sitting on the bed. In his arms lay Sue's, his one love. Their hair lay all around like a wake. It was matted, blood matted. Tristan looked up at my entrance. His eyes were wet diamonds. Can you help me? he said. What's happening? Sue's. Somebody caught a stray bullet. Tristan reached out his hand towards me, offering a pair of scissors. I want you to do this. I looked down at the body of Sue's, held there upon his lap, unbreathing. Oh, I don't think I can do it, Trist. Nobody else will. Tristan's eyes. So I took the scissors in my trembling hands. There are only two parts of the body that don't feel pain. One is the hair, the other is the nails. Let me tell you about that. Not true. I've seen the tears at the cutting. Carly slipped through the gap in the left open door. I worked the scissors through at a severe angle, slicing the droid locks. It took some kind of strength to do it, and I was kind of proud. And it took some time, because the air was thick and clogged up with debris. Spent matches, jewels, hair grips, dog fur. And that was just in three weeks since the last washing. That droid air was so thick, it was like cutting through the night. Until eventually I separated them. Tristan from Sue's. Carly, the robo-bitch, was licking at the face of the corpse, trying to wake her. Nothing would wake her. I'd come down from Pleasureville two or maybe three o'clock in the afternoon. I'd attended the sickbed of my best and worst friend. I'd cut some hair, cut two people in half. You know, just one of those days. Now I was tired. So tired. And I just wanted to sleep, even though I knew we should be moving on, out of there. Because the cops have got your number, Scribble, and you're maybe on a death list. Murdoch's list. So guess what, Murdoch? You're on mine. All this added up. And I shouldn't have even been thinking about lying down on that couch, fully clothed, my eyes closing, heavy with the world, thinking about how this story started. Mandy coming out of that all-night vert you want, dodging dogs and cops. Christ, I was playing it back already. And I remember thinking that if ever I get out of this, with body and soul still connected, well then, I was going to tell the whole story. And this is how it would start. Mandy came out of the all-night vert you want, clutching a bag of goodies. OK, so this is twenty years later, and I'm only just getting round to it. I picked up the birthday card, read Desdemona's message, put down the card, picked up the feather. I was moving like some cheap, made-in-Taiwan robo. I sucked the feather in real deep, down to the shaft. I could feel the waves approaching over the music's swelling main theme, intercut with the credits. But then the waves were moving backwards, taking the music with them, so I was getting the fade, and then the hit of each note, and I was in there somewhere, losing the sense of trouble, the sense of now. I was being inverted. Desdemona came out of the all-night vert you want, clutching a bag of goodies. There was no trouble. A nice, clean pickup. Des is an expert. We love her for that. We rode the stash back to the flat. The fearless four of us, Beetle and Bridget, Desdemona and I. What's in the bag, sister? Beauties. A yellow. Her voice sent a shiver through me. Let's have a look. Desdemona pulled out a feather. A pure and golden flight path. 
Light shards thrown off the passing street lamps, changed to black by the van's mirrored windows, found themselves caught for a second upon the feathers' one million flights. Then they were reflected in fractals of gold, bouncing off the sides of the van like ricochets from the sun. Takshaka yellow, she said. Then Desdemona was talking with a saffron tongue, and I wanted to kiss my sister's voice because it was so very beautiful. She told us the story of young Utanka, the Asian student. He travelled into the realm of snakes in order to steal back the earrings of the queen. They were held by Takshaka, the king of the snakes. It was as long as a river, a violet and green river. His bite was deadly to human flesh, carrying poisonous dreams along the veins until the mind was polluted with violence. Sister kissed me, and I felt some petals falling on me inside the van, falling, falling. Inside me head, from some unimagined vert. We made an easy snakeless flight up the stairways into the pad, which welcomed us with a show of lights. B charged up the flight real good with Vaz, and then he fed it into our mouths, each of our mouths in turn, finishing with his own last of all. The fearless four of us are swimming in this lake of spices, getting ourselves marinated, getting ourselves painted in yellow. It surely is the sweetest colour. It was giving us flavours, flavours of the feast to come, things we'd never tasted. Warning! Shit, what was that? I was walking through a palace of gold. Me three companions at me side. In me hands, a ball hammer drenched in snakeweed. Only known antidote to the dream snake bite. The other three were loaded up the same and we were warriors in a bad world. And I felt full up of hunger and blood. Warning, you are now inside a metavert. Did you hear that, Des? Heard nothing. Beetle grinned. Come on, you two, let's the billy cooing. Let's hammer some snakes. We stalked that gilded world with our weapons of steel and weed and our fear and our sweat. A jasmine powder was dropping on us, but I was getting voices. Warning, you are now in the metavert room too. This is extremely unwise and should be vacated forthwith. Thank you, this has been a public health warning. You heard that, didn't you? What's up, love? That voice, listen to it, can't you hear it? We're in a metavert. Oh, don't be silly now. And as she said it, she held me hand in her own. Her fingers were soft and long, with sharpened nails that dug in just slightly, just enough. Beetle again. Okay, lovebirds, enough words. Here come the fuckers. And the snakes came, unraveling from the shadows, from the golden shadows, all violets and green, giving a shine to the world, a poisonous shine. They were coming in hundreds, but so tightly knotted, it would take more than a human span to count them. I tried to run. I think I tried to run. But something held me back. This could only be perfect. Takshaka the king rose up, his great head all mutilated and bleeding. He seemed to be made out of smoke, not flesh, a snake of smoke. You are really getting on my wick. Please vacate this meta level immediately. We hit that first line of snakes like a flesh hammer. And it all seemed so easy, so very easy for a yellow. So maybe yellows aren't all they're cracked up to be. Or maybe I was dreaming all this. Maybe I was getting the haunting again, seeing the dirt through the glass. No matter. Some dream snakes died that night, let me tell you. And afterwards, as we lay stomach to back, me right hand on her breasts, me left scrunched up against her neck, me right leg draped over her legs, me left tucked up, neat against her thighs, her breathing moving to mine like a twin clock, a man came into our room. Desdemona was fast asleep and so was I, but I could feel him there, in the darkened air, like a taste on the mouth long after the feast is gone. Young man, I am most disappointed in your conduct. My eyes wouldn't open. I was locked in fear. Open your eyes, young man. Something made me do it. Some outside force. My father was looking down at me. From the foot of the bed. Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Oh, Christ. Stay calm. 
It can't be. Can't be. Not me father. Just some older man. Be careful. I knew that voice. Game cat? Indeed. You remember me. I've never seen you before. Why, we met only this morning. At a rather sleazy affair, I'm afraid. Leave me alone. I was coming down from the fear by now. I'm getting pictures. Me standing on the balcony, looking down. The man standing beside me. No, I wasn't having that. This morning I was sleeping next to Desdemona in this very bed. Young man, you are in the vert. This is Game Cat speaking. Don't fight it, Kitling. You just did a yellow. You just did Takshaka. Think about it. So? That was a tapeworm, a yellow has to be. You'd be dead otherwise. Yellows do not come that easy. Did you not get the voices? Uh, I... You know that you did. Inside Takshaka, that was the sniffing general speaking. Who? The general's in charge of layers. You made him very, very angry. The game cat was looking down at me. His face had turned cold. You ever heard of Curious Yellow? Isn't it some high-level vert? The cat sighed wearily. Let me tell you about Curious Yellow. It's a sucker fuck, my kitling. A testing ground, if you like. A rites of passage game. It's painful. We are, at this moment, inside Tapewormer. It makes the past beautiful. It takes out all the bad stuff, exaggerates the good. Curious Yellow is the exact opposite. It makes the past into a nightmare and then strands you there with no hope of release. Only knowledge will get you out. Listen, I've been there. It takes all you've got. So? That's where your sister is, curious yellow, trapped there, suffering, dying, and you, young man, are spending your time in wanker feathers, like this one, making believe that she is safe. That disgusts me. This speech had finished me. It felt like I was being told some ultimate truth. I knew it had to be true, and yet it went against the world I was living in. Am I getting through, Scribble? You're confusing me. I had to do this. Tapewormer is not the way. I need you out there. Where? In the real world. You'll be pulling out soon, and when you do, all this will make sense. I have something to ask of you. Will you look after my brother for me? Now, don't protest. His name is Tristan. No, no, don't say anything. Consider this a dream. It may be easier that way, and that soon you will awake. Do you understand? Almost. Good. Let Sirius guide you. Gamecat reached inside his jacket and pulled out a feather. It was a silver feather. Do you have anything to give me? I shook my head. The feather was holding me, the way the lights were dancing on it. That card will do. He was looking over at our bedside table. The birthday card was lying there. Give me that. I gave it to him, and he placed the feather in my hands. It rested in my palm like a sliver of the moon. Do you know what it is? It's a silver, an operator feather. Yes, its name is Sniffing General. The general is a door guard, perhaps one of the most powerful. Be very careful when dealing with him. You may find need of him one day. Where'd you get it? Hobart gave it to me. I was so shocked. I almost dropped the silver. You've met Hobart? Sniffing General is Hobart's servant. Everybody knew about Hobart, but nobody knew anything. Just the hundreds of rumours that surrounded the name. Hobart invented Vert. Hobart is alive, Hobart is dead, Hobart is a man, a woman, a child, an alien. Nobody knew anything. What is Hobart, Cat? But he'd vanished. Oh, Christ, what was that? There was a light shining under the bedroom door, and I knew that I'd turned all the lights out before following Desdemona to bed. It was a green and violet light, and I could smell saffron in the air as drifts of smoke found their way in through cracks. I turned to wake Desdemona. She'd slipped away from me, unseen. I was alone. 
Everything was slipping away. The room, the world, the love. I was in a vert, haunted. That terrible sadness. Takshak had exploded through the door. A great rush of colours and mists riding around the room, even as the room started to fade. And I, I was pulling out. I was working the jerk-out switch, but getting nowhere. Stuck between worlds, knowing in my mind exactly what I was, even whilst my body was clinging to the vert. And somebody calling me name. Takshak had opened his mouth wide to show off the bloated poison sack at the back of his throat. Scribble! That voice... Help me, voice. Help me. Takshaka closed his mouth slightly until I could see his eyes again and catch the look that was there. Shadow cop. Scribble, come out, please. That voice calling to me, Twinkle's voice. King of the snakes soaring down at me. Do it now. Do the jerk out. Do it. Intense wrenching somewhere in the body, and I was falling onto the settee as though from miles away. Shaking, shaking. Twinkle was shaking me. I was stretched out full length on an old settee in a rented room in Wally Range, and Carly, the robo bitch, was licking at my face, and Twinkle was bending over me. I brought my hand up to my face, the beetle's gun in my hand. I waited it. Feeling its power. Opened it up. Saw two bullets left in there. Mine to use. In the other hand, a silver feather lay waiting. Sniffing general. Door god. Key to the cat. Scribble. You brought back a silver, cried Twinkle. Well done. Well done? Well then, yeah, well done. Well fucking done. I was coming through. It's all your scribble. It's your show. Let Sirius guide you. And I knew exactly what he meant. The dog star. I'm coming after you. All my lost ones. 